Uh, you are listening to Sean of the South, and I'm your host tonight, Sean Dietrich, coming to you live via the podcast, Dear Waves and Radio Waves, all over this fine nation. This episode brought to you by Case Knives, a tradition of my family, dating back to my granddaddy, who once said the best cure for idle hands was to build something, and by folklore brewing and meadery, quite literally the best brew in Alabama, and they have the awards to prove it. Visit folklore brewing and meadery. Dot com. Also, this portion of our program brought to you by Midnight Shift Coffee, the official coffee of the Pensacola Police Department. A buck from every bag goes to benefit the Riley Foundation, which helps to fight pediatric cancer. Visit MidnightShiftCoffee.com. That's pretty much all the ads I can think about today. <laughs> I figure I'd get them out of the way with first because today's a interesting day uh, for me podcast wise i almost didn't even do this uh, uh the way that the world has been going lately i would just be honest with you it's gotten me down it really has now this is about the uh we're coming up on the fourth week of uh, i mean the fourth month that is of quarantine for me and my wife i, I could i mean i think it's more like three and a half months right now but fourth month is staring us in the face and it has uh, worn on me. It's not just the quarantine. It's it's uh, it's everything happening in in the world and on the world stage. Uh, I guess I'm just human, and it's catching up with me. It has zapped my enthusiasm for things like uh, being funny or 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 be doing creative things that uh, just suddenly seem so shallow. And, and so trivial in light of of the riots that are taking place in all the major cities and even the minor cities and even the little small rural hamlets between all the major cities and minor cities, the riots, but also the peaceful protests. So it's gotten me down. Now, I, I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, I feel OK right now. I'm not, you know, depressed in that uh, I, I just can't seem to smile. I just don't know. <sighs> I just don't know. I believe in my fellow man sometimes, and sometimes I, sometimes I just don't know. Well, enough of that. I probably uh, depressed half of my listening audience and had everybody turn off their stuff. We've had a lot of requests for me to just go ahead and read stuff that I have written, uh, which... I don't mind doing. Uh, I'm not the world's b best reader uh, when it comes to reading stuff, but I figure why not, you know. At least it'll uh, give you something to listen to. It, it feels so self-indulgent to even be talking to this microphone while there's all these demonstrations going on all over the U.S., but, uh, you know, here we go. Why not? Now, this first thing I'm reading is... Uh, Something I wrote uh, just about, I don't know how many days ago it was, wasn't long ago, my last week. Uh, it's called, uh, officially, uh, I titled it Stained Glass Windows. A Catholic chapel with ornate finery everywhere. The dark sanctuary has brilliant stained glass windows that light the room with multicolors. Now, I'm not Catholic, but it's pretty in here. I called ahead to see if the chapel was open. I guess I expected it to be closed during the pandemic. The guy on the phone said the chapel was available for private reflection, but not for service. And I had to wear a mask. So I visited on a whim. I made a long drive just to get here. See, I... I needed time to clear my head. I've been stuck in the house, just like everyone else, for 70-some-odd quarantine days. Mm. You know, I think the worst part about being trapped indoors is the only view of the outside world you get comes through a TV or an Internet device. God help us all. But this little chapel is filled with peace, which is so hard to come by these days. I walk through the door. You doing okay, man? asked the janitor. He's wearing a surgical mask. He's Latino with a thick accent. 
Are you all right today? No, oh, yeah, I'm fine, I said. I sit in a pew. I'm one of only three people in this chapel. There's a woman in the pew ahead of me. There's an old man lighting a candle. Nobody makes eye contact. See, when you come to a place like this, it's not for socializing or eye contact. You come here to... Well, I don't actually know. Like I said, I, I'm not Catholic. The janitor finds me again, and he whispers, Are you here for confession or reconciliation? Do you want me to get the padre? <laughs> the padre. No thanks, I say. I'm just here to think. Just here to think today. But then again, I start to think about that. See, I've never done a Catholic-style confession before. I was raised Southern Baptist, and our version of confession was singing just as I am for 1,192 choruses and then packing up shop and going to the Piccadilly restaurant for lunch. Confession. Hmm. Sure, why not? So the janitor goes and fetches the priest, and I'm sitting there thinking... My mother would disown me if she knew what I was doing. The first thing I learned about confession is that it is a remarkably uncomplicated procedure. Basically, you crawl into a sweat box that's about the size of a phone booth, and there's this little privacy screen between you and the priest, and you talk. I wait for the priest to arrive, sitting in this little booth, and... I'm already having second thoughts about being here. I'm nervous. I've never done this before, and I kind of wish I wouldn't have come. I'm considering slipping out the little door and leaving because I don't want to waste this man's time. Finally, I hear movement on the other side. The privacy door between us opens, and there's this little metal grate that separates us. It's amazing what kinds of tiny bodily noises you can hear in this enclosed space. For instance, his nose is whistling. I'm the first to speak. I say, I'm not Catholic. I admit this right up front so nobody gets their feelings hurt. It's all right, says the priest. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. Already I like this guy. I say, do I have to say anything special, Father? Like, uh, bless me, Father, for I've sinned. He says, hmm, well, we could just talk. And then he explains that I can say whatever I want. There are no judgments here. Well, this kind of surprises me. No judgments? What a concept. I mean, this means I don't have to tailor my words to suit the person who's listening. I can just tell them what I feel. Remarkable. So that's exactly what I do. I tell him everything. I tell him I'm worried sick about this world. Sometimes I get pretty anxious about it. Last night, for example, I turned on the news to see riots. Flaming cars. Screaming. Fighting. Looting. Glass storefronts shattered, people screaming, tearing their clothes. Sometimes it overwhelms me. Not to mention this little thing called the coronavirus. <sighs> I hear nothing on the other side of the confessional booth for a moment. Then I hear the padre clear his throat. And he says, Yeah, me too. His voice is a lot older than mine. This man is 65, maybe 70, I'd say. I say, you mean you're scared too, Father? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is scary stuff, he says. Well, this is not what I expect from a priest. I mean, I guess I expected him to instruct me to say 129 Hail Marys and to start eating fish on Fridays. But after he says what he says, there's only a lot of silence between us. I say, are you wearing a face mask, Father? <laughs> yes. Are you? Yes. 
more awkward quiet. Do you know what I think, the priest says, breaking the silence between us. I think that you and I are both very, very blessed. Why, I say. Well, think about it. We're alive. We're healthy. It's beautiful weather outside. You know, I rode my bike six miles this morning. Nobody speaks for a few moments. I'm too busy thinking about what he just said. All I can come up with is, Father, I just feel sorry. He says, sorry for what? And I don't really know. See, I guess I'm, I'm sorry for my fellow man and the atrocities we've committed. I'm sorry that children are frightened to live in this world. I'm sorry that some people hate other people. I am sorry that any human being could harm another human being. I'm sorry for being selfish sometimes. I'm sorry I can't make anything better. I'm just sorry all over. The priest pauses. He says, Yeah, you and me both. You and me both. But do you know what? What, I say. He takes a deep breath. I can hear him sigh. He says, we're loved. There's a lot more quietness in the booth. I can hear his nose whistling like a mini kazoo right now. If I'm being honest, all I've ever wanted was to be loved. Everything I've ever done in this world has been a half-hearted attempt to make sure that I'm loved. Maybe love is all anyone wants in this world. And maybe if there were more of it, there'd be less to be sorry about. I say to him, Thanks, Father. He chuckles and he says, And I was like me. Then the old man plays, prays a short blessing with lots of three-syllable words, and I can hear him making the sign of the cross, his clothes are rustling. His prayer is pure poetry, and he's a very nice man. When he finishes, he amens, and I say, Just so we're clear, Father, this don't mean I'm Catholic now. He says, Oh, of course not. But you are a child of God. And so am I. And make no mistake about it. So are you. next one I wrote here uh, I call Sparrows. Uh, that's probably all the introduction I guess I need. Last night a bird flew into our kitchen window. You wouldn't have believed it. We were eating supper when it happened. We heard a loud crash against the glass and it startled us. My wife and I walked into the backyard to find a red-bellied woodpecker lying on the grass and convulsing. My wife picked it up. She held it. We talked to it. Oh, it was so sad. It was so sad. I can't stand to see an animal suffer. My wife said, It's a baby. I think it broke its neck. And she was starting to cry. Of course, she wasn't only crying about the bird, at least not entirely. She's like everybody else right now in this world we live in. She's crying because this world has given us a lot to cry about lately. Not just quarantines, riots, and deaths. It's everything else in between. It's uh, been hard to keep smiling. 
We named the bird Beatrice. Don't ask me why. <laughs> we put Beatrice into a shoebox and fed her wet cat food, and we watched her sleep on a bed of pine straw. She seemed to be somewhat improving. We weren't sure. The thing is, we've been finding a lot of wounded animals lately, ever since this quarantine began. I guess it's just because we have nothing else better to do. Last month alone, we nursed one wounded cat, one broken-winged butterfly, and one lame, star lame starling. Now, the cat survived. The butterfly died. The starling needed professional medical care. Didn't seem to be improving. And so, we took it to get help. It's an interesting story. I found the starling outside my office one morning. It was a baby bird, brown and white speckled, flailing on the ground. My wife named him Boomer. Boomer slept in the shoebox beside our bed. We really wanted him to improve, but he just didn't. Finally, when Boomer's wing wasn't getting any better, we caught a wildlife rehab, and we drove a few hours to get there. That day, there were a few people ahead of us in line, cradling boxes that contained animals. And there was this little girl with bright blonde hair, wearing red tennis shoes. She held a box, and in that box was a wild rabbit. Her mother was beside her. Her little sister was beside her. And we were all standing on the sidewalk, wearing face masks, waiting our turn. This was a quarantine. They weren't letting us in the building, and they were making us keep our distance. This is a rabbit, the little girl told me. Do you know rabbits? Do I know rabbits, I'm thinking. I smile at her and I say, that's nice. She says, yeah, I found him. His name's Larry. This kid was all business when it came to her rabbit. She said, Larry can't walk or run, but, oh, he's cool. I've had him ever since last week. And she just kept on talking until her eyes focused on my shoebox and she stopped her stream of consciousness and said, what kind of animal do you have? Then the girl opened my box without even asking. Obviously, this kid hadn't heard about social distance and regulations. She screamed when she saw what was in my box. Elation came out of her mouth. Oh, man, it's a bird. Mom, I love those things. Her mother laughed and then apologized for her daughter's outburst. She said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. My daughter just loves animals. We're always rescuing animals. She and her grandma are always just rescuing tons of cats and squirrels, and we even rescued a baby alligator once. The girl held out her arms like she was measuring a big old fish. She said, yeah, me and my grandma found an alligator. He was this big, and I wanted to keep it, but my grandma says that alligators eat lap dogs. <laughs> lap dogs. How nice, I'm thinking. The sun was getting hot while we waited for the nurse to receive our animals. I could see the little girl starting to get emotional when she realized that her time with Larry was coming to an end. Her mood was getting a little more somber. Her mother kept reminding her. She said, sweetie, don't be sad. Remember what your grandma always says. But the girl wasn't thinking of grandma. She ignored her mother. She started stroking the rabbit's head. She said, Rabbits are my favorite animal. Mm -hmm. I love them. Now, what's your favorite animal? She said to me. I had to think about it. I said, Dogs. Dogs are my favorite animal, I guess. The girl's attention drifted back to Larry. She lifted Larry from his box and she held him, wetting his fur with her kisses. She was talking to Larry like he could understand her. To say this child loved a rabbit would be an understatement. This girl would have stepped in front of traffic for Larry. Finally, the nurse came to take the animal. But the girl was having a hard time letting go. She tried to be brave. Really, she did. But it just wasn't working. 
She began to sob, and her mother had to pry the animal loose from her arms. The girl said, They're going to take care of you, Larry. They're going to make you all better. I promise, Larry. I love you, Larry. And the woman had scrubs took Larry away. They disappeared through the back doors, and we could all feel the little girl's heart shatter into a million pieces. The tears of a child are precious. Remember what your grandma says, her mother said again, wiping the girl's face with her sleeve. Now, my curiosity got the best of me. I think I just had to know. So I asked the girl's mother, what does grandma always say? Her mother said, grandma always says that love is the best medicine, and it's the best thing that we can give. Before they left, the child wiped her snotty nose with her palms, and she looked at me with big eyes and said, I hope your bird feels better. I watched them pile into their minivan before driving away. And I sure hope that child found another wounded animal to love. Anyway, we took the woodpecker to the wildlife hospital across the county line. Beatrice, that was the woodpecker's name. And it was the same scenario as before, more or less. The same hot weather, same surgical masks, out on the sidewalk, waiting to get indoors. Same shoebox containing a very similar bird. My wife kept lifting the shoebox lid. And she kept whispering to the bird until we finally turned it over to the nurses. When the lady came to take the animal away, my wife whispered to the bird. She said, Goodbye, Beatrice. We love you. We both waved farewell on our way out the door, and I sort of felt silly saying goodbye to a woodpecker, but lately I'm getting used to feeling silly. My wife was smiling at me, but her eyes were pink. She leaned her head onto my shoulder. I said, don't be sad, honey. Remember what Grandma always says. And in these troubled times, I hope I never forget what Grandma says. This next one is uh, one I wrote a few days ago, actually. Uh, I wrote it after I'd watched some of the riots on television, the protests that had turned violent. And I flipped the channel, and there was another protest in another city, and that had turned violent. And I flipped the channel, and there was another protest in another city, and that had turned violent. There were flames. Everything was just getting real scary. Uh, and then uh, I... My wife was flipping through her phone, and she showed me on on social media there was nothing but these black squares, millions and millions of black squares, you know, no pictures, nobody updating you on what they were eating for the night. You know, people love to take pictures of their food. No, it was just black squares, and, and then I was looking on some Internet news, and, you know, one cop gets stabbed, uh, this policeman got beaten. That, I don't know what to say. I just don't know what to say. Then you sit back down and you look on international news, those uh, fancy dancy channels that we get, and it's showing demonstrations and protests that are turning violent in India, in London. And I just started to feel my, my mood sink. Well, uh, I have this old uh, tape that someone gave me a long time ago. And it's got an old voice on it. It dates back to 1957, the recording on the tape. And uh, I guess I'll just read, which, uh, uh, read to you what I wrote. Uh, I entitled this piece, uh, One Morning on Dexter Avenue. The year is 1957. Montgomery, Alabama is bathed in sunshine. 
birds in nearby trees are singing. The street is lined with large-bodied cars, DeSotos, Plymouths, Chevys, and Studebakers. It's Sunday morning, and people are on their way to church. The Baptist church that sits on the corner of Dexter Avenue and Decatur Street is full. People are filing into their pews. It's been quite a year, 57. The Soviet Union just launched Sputnik. Vietnam is heating up. Hurricane Audrey tore up the Gulf Coast. Nine teenage African-American students began attending the all-white Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. And just when times couldn't get any harder, Jackie Robinson retired. Ooh, it's hot inside this old building. People are finding themselves with church bulletins. The room is alive with the chatter of hard-working men and women dressed in their Sunday finery. Service begins. Everyone stands. A choir sings a few hymns. People clap in rhythm with the singing. A little boy does his best to clap along with everyone else, but he just can't quite get it. You know, it's hard not to fall in love with the church building itself. Oh, it's marvelous. The faded red bricks, the cathedral windows, the acoustic dome behind the pulpit. You get this feeling that in a building like this, there are lots of stories within these walls. This building was erected in 1883 on a small lot facing the Alabama State Capitol. The elders bought the land for 270 bucks back then. The church took six years to construct, but a lifetime to build. When the music ends, a preacher man takes the pulpit. He is a medium-sized man, maybe 5'7", maybe 5'6". The visitors are always surprised how short he is. People always imagine he was being 12 foot tall and made of granite. The preacher wears a plain black robe with a skinny necktie. He has a full face, sharp eyes, and a little mustache. But there is nothing small about the clergyman's voice. It travels throughout the crevices of this old building like a folk song. He speaks in the anvil tones of an ironsmith, using short sentences that hit harder than a Buick. The crowd offers a response after each of the preacher's phrases. Newcomers find themselves getting swept up in the excitement of it all. There are a few journalists standing in the back, some scribbling on notepads and a few with microphones. The sermon, however, is nothing like what the people expected here today. See, many of them were thinking the preacher would call fire down from the ceiling. But today's homily is nothing like that. No, oh, no, the preacher grips the lectern, and he says in a soft, melodic voice, I want to turn your attention to the subject of loving your enemies. People shift in their seats. A middle-aged woman dabs sweat from her forehead with a hanky. A little boy dressed in a blue serge suit becomes fidgety. The preacher says, It is a love that seeks nothing in return. It is an overflowing love. It's what theologians would call the love of God. The sea of faces before him is nothing but earnest. A few lean forward in their seats. A baby in the back begins to cry. The preacher shouts, Love! Love! And when you give rise to love on this level, you begin to love men not because they are likable, but because God loves them. More amens from the congregation. One can't help but notice how sincere the preacher is. A lot of preachers flail their hands around and scream, but he uses no theatrics. The five foot seven man is merely talking in the key of E major. Look at every man and love him. Because you know God loves him. Though he might be the worst person you've ever seen, love him. Everyone is uttering amens now. And the preacher's just getting warmed up. He stands behind the ornate pulpit, made of wood, raising his voice to hit notes not found on the musical staff. He's not so much yelling 
a serenade in the saints. There are a lot of people I find difficult to like, he says. I don't like what they do to me. I don't like what they say about me. I don't like the attitudes. I don't like some of the things they're doing. I don't like them. But Jesus said to love them. By now, a few have risen to their feet. Several are waving their hands. The preacher is hitting them where they live now. He works with the same elegant mastery you'd find in a Michelangelo in a Bach prelude. Or when Willie Howard Mays Jr. catches a fly ball. He says, just keep loving people. Keep loving them, even though they mistreat you. A person who's a neighbor or a person who's doing something wrong to you, just keep being friendly to that person. Keep loving them. Don't do anything to embarrass them. Just keep loving them. And by the power of your love, they will break down under the load. And the young woman's crying now. So are choir members, old men, teenagers, even reporters and journalists. It's not so much what the preacher's saying. It's what the outside world's been doing lately. People are fighting. Some are tearing the fabric of kindness in two. The preacher lowers his voice and the room gets quiet with the occasional sniffle from the crowd. Not even the preacher wipes his face with his own hand. He says, And so this morning... As I look into your eyes and into the eyes of all my brothers in Alabama and all over America and all over the world, and I say to you, I love you, and I would rather die than hate you. Yes, sir. Dr. King sure could preach. Let's see here. I'll read a few more for you. Uh, if for no other reason than just to kill some time. Uh, it's been an interesting time of our uh, existence. Music has become sort of important in every difficult time. It's interesting what kind of role music plays in difficult times in history. A lot of people don't pay attention to how uh, important music is it helps define things nowhere is this more true than the song we shall overcome first introduced in i believe 1959 by pete Seeger to the american masses that is not it was not the that was not the first time the song ever made it onto the the world scene the song itself is very very old and the version that we know of it today, We Shall Overcome, actually um, originated with workers on a tobacco strike in the Carolinas who uh, 
sang, sang it like that uh, in 47, long before Pete Seeger came along uh, and, and made it his own. And Joan Baez uh, sang it too. Uh, they ruled that that song should be in a public domain because uh, Pete Seeger and Joan Baez admitted that they did not write you know, this song. Uh, and all the other people who sang it admitted that they did not have any they heard it that was how they put it they heard this song well the folks in 1947 who marched for the tobacco strikes um, they also heard it from somewhere and I wrote a little little thing about uh, where the song came from Uh, I'll just go ahead and read it it's a spring evening in West Florida it's humid the sun is low, and I am watching three old men strum guitars and sing, We Shall Overcome, on their front porch. They are singing through a small amplification system for the rest of my neighborhood. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. It's a tense world we live in right now, filled with protests and upset people and people wearing surgical masks to protect themselves from disease and riots and flames and smoke and yelling. So while these men play and sing, I close my eyes. The old men, you see, are completely tone deaf, but they make up for it with sincerity. They're ex-hippies with longish hair and sandals, and they've drawn a small crowd. You see, we're all social distancing. We have nothing else better to do, so here we are, listening to their impromptu jam session. An older couple sits in a driveway across the street. A young family sits on a blanket in their front yard. Kids linger on bikes, eating popsicles. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. Two older ladies on a porch swing are sipping from wine glasses. They wear protective medical face masks. One woman spills wine all over her shirt. (laughs) She laughs about it. She hiccups. And she keeps on singing. Baby boomers. The guitarist speaks over the microphone while we're singing. He says, you know, I remember going to civil rights marches with my dad. My dad was a Methodist minister. We stood arm in arm with people of all colors in Birmingham. And we would always sing this song. And the old men sing it again. We shall overcome someday. This song, this song, you know this song. The melody itself has been used by billions all over the world. It was once invoked on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial by a crowd of 300,000 people. Martin Luther King Jr. recited it in his final sermon only hours before he was shot. But this song's a lot older than that. And I wonder if anyone listening tonight outside here in West Florida, knows how old the song truly is. Well, I happen to know. Though, to be fair, the only reason I know the history of this song was because I had to write a college paper about it once. Well, technically, if we're splitting hairs, my wife wrote the paper and I just put my name on it. (laughs) I was an adult in community college at the time, and the assignment was to write on 60s protest music so I asked my wife to help me she agreed but only if and this is true if I would pay her 200 bucks in most states this is called marital extortion but what I learned was that we shall overcome as a few versions see it officially dates back to 1900 an African American minister Charles Albert Tindley wrote a tune named I'll Overcome Someday and that song became the basis for this song skipping over a lot of history I'll just go ahead and tell you that you might not know Charles Tindley but I'll bet you know his music 
especially if your mama forced you to attend church like mine did. He wrote, take your burdens to the Lord and leave it there. Leave it there, leave it there. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave it there. He wrote, by and by when the morning comes, all the saints of God be gathering home. We will tell the story of how we've overcome. We will understand it better by and by. Ooh, good songs. Charles was a son of a slave, born in Maryland before the end of the Civil War. He was raised in an unkind world. He was a large man, with hands like bear claws, wide shoulders, and a concrete jaw. He was completely self-educated, too. From childhood, he began piecing together his own education like a mismatched jigsaw puzzle. He taught himself to read and how to compose music. As a young man, he wanted to learn Hebrew so he could translate biblical manuscripts. So he went to a local synagogue and begged the old men to teach him. Soon, Charles was reading Hebrew better than the rabbis. Then, just for the heck of it, he learned Greek, too. Later in life, he got a job working as a janitor at a church on Bainbridge Street in Philadelphia. A big, beautiful church. It was an unpaid position, so he took another part-time gig carrying bricks. Bricks. Eventually, he applied for ordination. Now, a lot of people said this was a silly idea. After all, Charles was just a manual laborer with no formal education. Still, the Methodist Episcopal Church finally agreed to let him take the entrance exam. And, well, his test scores were off the charts. After he was ordained, his life took off like a steam engine. He cared for orphans, fed the starving, and helped the destitute along the eastern seaboard. They shuttled him around from New Jersey to Pennsylvania to Delaware to Maryland until one day he got a letter in the mail. That church on Bainbridge Street where he'd once been a janitor, they asked Charles to be their preacher. Well, Charles didn't even have to think about it. He simply took his wife Daisy by the hand and he whisked her back to Philadelphia, and that was that. In a matter of years at that church, the small congregation of 103 exploded into 10,000. 10,000. It became one of the largest multiracial Methodist congregations on the East Coast. They say the crowds were something else often overflowing into the chilly streets of Philadelphia, huddling together and clustering on sidewalks just to hear the giant man preach, sing, and speak about overcoming. On the day of his funeral, 5,000 gathered into a tiny room that could only accommodate a few thousand. There were so many people in attendance that the building's foundation almost cracked. Today, Tindley's church still holds regular services. If you're ever in the area, stop by. You can't miss it. It's that building that's named after him. The old ex-hippies finish their musical set in our neighborhood, and we applaud. They take a bow. And I look into the sky. The sun is setting. The crickets are out. And I wonder if Charles can see us from where he is. I wonder if the humble man has been listening to us sing. We are a bunch of average people in an ordinary American neighborhood, singing words he wrote 120 years ago. Because in spite of all our faults, we believe him. If he can't hear us tonight, he will. Someday.
Well, I'll read my last one here. I imagine uh, if I hadn't put you to sleep already, uh, you're about to be asleep. <laughs> that's for sure. I apologize for the somber tone. I really do. I, I considered just kind of putting this podcast on hold for a little while while things uh, calm down out in our world. I'm still considering that. Um, I will let you know what what we decide, but uh, we'll come back. <laughs> I can tell you that, I promise. But uh, everything entertainment-wise feels just so shallow lately, and I'm I'm sorry. I really am. I wish I were... Um, I wish I were more, I wish I were stronger, I do, I wish I were uh, more mentally strong than I really am, but I get discouraged just like anybody else, it's it's only temporary, thank God for that, uh, just take care of yourself, whoever you are, out there listening, this has been a tough, uh, tough go of things, okay, this last one right here, I, I just wrote this, and uh, this is called the way we were. And I wrote this uh, because I met a kid while I was on a walk in my neighborhood. And this kid was, was so young and so happy. And I'm thinking about all the things our world's going through, the racial problems and the uh, protests and, and all the uh, the things people are saying about each other. And God knows how you know people are cutting each other's proverbial throats over politics and I'm looking at this kid and I'm thinking to myself I wonder if he knows I wonder if he knows all about that stuff I wonder if he knows it's going on and then I thought about kids in the near future and then kids in the distant future and then I thought about what it would be like when kids live in a technological age uh, 100 years 200 years from now and what they will think of us because everything that's happening right now is making history books people are documenting it whether we know it or not, they're they're writing it down. But history has a way of getting kind of screwed up along the way. It's hard to tell a, a real story without screwing it up. So I wrote a uh, a thing here called "The Way We Were," uh, and it's uh, it's pretty self explanatory. And this will be my last one. Dear kid, you're reading this a hundred years in the distant future. And I'm writing you from the distant past. You don't know me. And you never will, because by the time you read these words, I will have been dead and gone for a long time. Years from now, your history books will tell you about the society I live in. You'll have to memorize our famous dates, names, and capitals and spit them out during a third period history exam. Still, I wonder if you'll ever know who we truly were. I'll bet your textbook only dedicates two paragraphs to us, maybe even less. Our entire story probably lines somewhere between the names of our politicians and the groundbreaking achievements of our pop country music stars, and he'll glaze right over us. I was like you once. I remember looking at old photos of my grandparents, <laughs> and their era seemed like an antique universe. I remember thinking... How odd it was that my granddaddy wore his pants all the way up to his nipples. In school, I used to read about historical events like the Civil War, or the Spanish flu in 1918, the war to end all wars, or the polio epidemics, or the Second World War, and so on and so forth. I'd memorize the dates, take a quick test, and then I'd forget it all. Thus, today, I can't remember much about Christopher Columbus or exactly when George Washington crossed the Delaware. And I definitely can't tell you nothing about Long Division. So that's why I thought I'd tell you about what our civilization was like one century before you came along. Mostly, we were good folks. And we were fun people, really. I remember when our society came out with these fun devices called smartphones. They changed our world. I mean, suddenly everybody on planet Earth, regardless of nationality, religion, or creed, had the God-given right to snap pictures of their lunch and then post it on the Internet. Oh, it was great. One day archaeologists will discover our food pictures and selfies, and they'll wonder about us. 
Well, all I can tell you is that we were fun. We loved good movies, good beer, good barbecue. Before social distancing, we would gather in these huge groups. We went to concerts and symphonies and jazz clubs and honky-tonks. But when the coronavirus hit, everything changed. I remember sitting in my den, watching the news. I was terrified. And I mean genuinely, fight or flight, frightened. The nightly news often does that to people of my time, kid. After only a few weeks, the whole world had shut down. Pizza joints quit delivering. The institution of baseball dried up. We stayed home for a worldwide quarantine and tried to entertain ourselves with those tiny smartphones I told you about. At first, the quarantines weren't so bad. Everyone was staying positive, and these charitable things were happening all over in big cities and small cities. People in Atlanta were collecting groceries for the elderly. School children in Texas wrote heartfelt letters to those sheltered in nursing homes. Kids in Pittsburgh were singing happy birthday on the porches of old people who were quarantined. Everyone was doing video calls. But then some people started to lose heart. The hard times got to be like hairline stress fractures in the American heart. Sadness and uncertainty became the drink of choice. Depression rates skyrocketed. And so did suicides. Soon, nobody was taking pictures of food anymore. Then came the injustices. And the hatred. And the violence. And the riots. And all the terrible things that you'll read about in your history book. But when you read these things, even though they shock you, don't despise us for them, I beg of you. In fact, that's why I'm writing you. We're people, just like you. Are we fools? Yes, we can be. But it's in our nature to be foolish because we're human. I don't like to admit this any more than you do about my own kind, but... That doesn't make it any less true. I'm just as bad as anyone else, truth be told. See, sometimes mankind, I think, is like a swarm of confused ants crawling up on a big hot air balloon that's drifting way out into the cosmos somewhere. Occasionally, we don't know who we are, why we're here, or where we're going. People hurt each other, and our fellow men do ugly things. It embarrasses me to tell you about the horrors of mankind. So, I hope you read between the lines of your textbook when you learn about us one day. And I hope you see more than just our greed, and our selfishness, and our black-hearted malice, and our pop country music. I hope you realize that people have the capability of being so incredible, so benevolent, and so selfless that at times we are more than mere ants, but we are soaring to heaven itself. We are the same species that produced Francis of Assisi, Gandhi, Neil Tusheng, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, Corey Tin Boom, and a Galilean peasant who was a lot of fun at weddings. We produced Rembrandt, Bach, Handel, Vivaldi, Chopin, Vermeer, Monet, Joaquin Sorolla, Harriet Tubman, Mark Twain, Laura Ingalls Wilder, Knight Cole, Ray Charles, Mickey Mantle, Hank Aaron, Joan Namath, Herschel Walker, Norman Rockwell, Bo Jackson, and Frank, Nina Simone, Mississippi John Hurt, and Willie Nelson. Good God, we were beautiful. Someday you'll be reading this, and your world will be futuristic and turbulent. These ancient problems I'm telling you about will seem medieval almost 100 years in the future. By then I will be dust, and my memory will be erased. But make no mistake about it, kid. Your society will have its own problems, too. So I hope you learn from ours. Because we were a people who had the capacity to love just like you. 
Many times we did, but not nearly as often as we could have. Anyway, that's all for now. Take care of yourself, and for heaven's sake, take care of others too.